you. Welcome to the Cosmos Community Call. Today we're going to do some roadmap updates, and then we have a special guest, the Bear Chain guys, talking about Polaris, which is their EVM module that they have been working on. Also, a shout out to Bear Chain on announcing their uh, raise. So, just for the memes, I'm betting they raised 400. They raised that evaluation of 400 uh, for 2069. So 420.69, and we announced it on 420. So it's always a good meme, I would say. Um, so shout out to them. And let's get started on some of these roadmap updates. I'm going to share my screen quickly. want to go over some of the items uh, that is blocking for the Eden release and then some of the items for our Q2 deliverables. So you can follow this in the Cosmos projects and the Cosmos SDK dashboard um, project board. So the two blocking items right now um, are ABCI++ and the core API for the Eden release. Why did we include the core API? Well, um, the API for ABCI++, the 2.0 changes quite drastically with the introduction of finalized block. Finalized block merges begin block, all the deliver transaction methods, and end block into one um, request response from Comet. And so in this scenario, um, how you do validator set updates and how you get things like evidence and vote info changes because it's no longer in the request body of begin block. And so we're introducing a core API that if you're doing validator set updates, you would use for val set update. And if you're getting comment based info, like things like vote info, proposer address, um, the evidence, um, things like that, that you would use that. And then there's a separate header info uh, interface that would give you height, time, chain ID, and the hash. And so, like in this scenario, the items that are like generalized across blockchains or across state machines, consensus engines, which we can agree on is header, um, is height, uh, time, chain ID. Uh, those will like stay consistent, but the info about comment will be in a separate one. Um, so those things are gonna help with ABCI++. Where we are with ABCI++, so we've migrated store. Um, Bez is working, Bez just merged the foot extensions. He began working on modules. Um, I did the store and there's a bunch of us working on um, ASAP and the other modules so we can try and get it done. Our timeline is ideally we were we want to aim for around the end of the month to at least have ABCI 2.0 merged into um, into main um, or at least ready and reviewed to be merged into main so we can try and tag a alpha tag um, so we can begin the QA process um, in May. Um, and so we can try and get that feature out as fast as possible and allow people to begin testing against. Some items on the core API that are still outstanding is um, we, we need to specify uh, the uh, block info and consensus service. This is what I was just talking about, about the header info and about the comment info. Um, on top of that, we just have, uh, we need to do some documentation and specify a gas service. The gas service would define uh, how you use gas and where you, and where, and which modules are able to use gas and stuff like this. So you'd be able to pass that instead of relying on this global context that we pass around everywhere today. Um, this, this bullet point is quite interesting and it actually leads into another epic down here, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, is there any questions on the two items that are currently blocking for the Eden release, which will be the next release? No questions. Awesome. So um, we have some items on the nice to have, which aren't blocking, but it'd be nice to just get them in. So removal global back 32. Um, we've done a large uh, amount of refactor. So a lot of modules are now taking an address codec to decode and encode back 32 addresses. This is specific around addresses, uh, account addresses, validator addresses are next. Um, there's one module left, which is bank. And then we want to slowly start marking some of these global back 32 items as deprecated so users can migrate in a timely fashion. 
Um, the goal here is basically we want to remove globals, and this will help when people use SDK to build clients, but it's also a lot more uh, to build tooling and clients, but it's also a lot more explicit on um, your address encoder and decoder. Um, we did some, we added some, we added two endpoints to assist if IBC relayers want to use, um, if they want to use gRPC um, instead of Comet. Um, why would they want to use GRPC? Well, um, right now, if the if they were to use the uh, comet, it's kind of it's a known DOS vector, and it may not be as performant. Um, and also, you you are able to use ABC query um, for um, through GRPC, which will allow like more parallelism um, instead of this context this this uh, mutex that is locked on the. ABCI level, um, and so it's now we just introduced a single endpoint that you can get all the required data. We work with the with the Hermes team and the uh, Go Relayer team to implement some of these changes and get things that are required for them. Next, sign mode handlers. So right now, um, any any questions on those two items or on the GPC GRPC requirements for IBC relayers? Nothing so far. Um, on the sign mode handlers, so there's a, a pretty large refactor to, to move all the signing criteria to X slash TX. As you may know, if you've played around in the Cosmos SDK, they're actually embedded in the off module right now. And so we were trying to move them out so we can get rid of this dependency graph between all these modules and off. Um, Matt's been leading that endeavor. Um, most items are done. There's a few open PRs that we're, like, that we're currently reviewing. And this will help also with allowing Auto CLI and Hubble to um, allow transaction support. Um, quick reminder of like Hubble, what Hubble is, it will be a tool to interact with all chains in the ecosystem. Um, so you won't have to download 20 binaries, you can just download a single binary and interact with all the chains in the ecosystem. How does it work? It uses GXC reflection. Oh, I heard someone unmuted. Questions? Oh, maybe it was an accident. Git signers. So um, what git signers is, is basically uh, in messages.go, you have a git signer method as part of sdk.message. Um, git signers gets the signer of the message. What are we doing here? Um, we The goal is to reduce what SDK message is to only be proto.message so we don't have to register the interface anymore. And instead, it can be a proto message. And message signers will be automatic if you don't want to set your own um, Git signer handler. So in the case of things like Ethermint and Polaris, they actually want to set their own Git signer. And so they will still be able to do that, just like if you don't if you don't want, if you want to remove some boilerplate from your modules because you're not doing any custom logic and you're just decoding back to addresses in, in the git signers method, then you'll be able to do so. Um, the only thing is, you will have to add some proto annotations, and those will be those are documented as well. Validate basic. Um, this is this is kind of an interesting one. Um, after long conversations with the team, um, there was. Uh, a bit of research on how things are done in the broader ecosystem of blockchain and how validation works um, in different ecosystems, Ethereum, Substrate, um, Solana, and so on. And we kind of discovered that we're kind of the only ones doing Validate Basic. And when we looked at like why Validate Basic exists um, and what does it add, we kind of, the, the con was the complexity it added to maintaining the system. And kind of the pro is now there isn't a assumption that um, now there is a hard fact that validation happens at the message server, and there's not a need to call validate basic. But this is a backwards compatible change. So if you um, you don't have to make this change in the SDK, we're making this change, but you're free to keep it keep validate basic as a stateless check on your messages if you do please. It is an extension interface, but as long as you keep validate basic as it is today, then your messages will contain. Um, the method. Questions there? Awesome. So migration of the new store module. So basically what we're doing here is IVL under, underwent a large refactor. Uh, we refactored the node key, which will allow it to be more performant. And so we want to um, 
use it in the new in our new store module. Um, when I say new, it's mainly just a Go mod. And so what we're doing here is identifying how to do a migration. And the approach that we came up with is um, there will be a lazy migration. So once you start up your node, your node won't have to do any sort of store migration um, for current state. And as you're as you're writing to state, the state will slowly be slowly be migrated to the new node key design. If you want to migrate your historical state, your archive node, um, which it is, we we do recommend it. It is a it is a long thing to do, but it will your archive nodes will become a lot more performant by doing this, and you may also save some space. And so there will be a separate tool um, as part of the binaries that you'll be able to use to migrate your archive nodes if you want to. Um, and that work, we're currently working on the lazy migration path um, in IVL. The PR was just opened. If you want to take a look, um, it is open. So that is the Eden release. That is the next release. Um, the main two items that we're working on is ABC++ and core API to try and get those done, primarily ABC++ to get it done as fast as possible for users to begin testing against going further in Q2. In Q2, some other things that we're landing are landing our validator consensus key rotation and validator operator key rotation. Um, uh, that one is, uh, I don't think the epic is here, but I can add it. Um, but essentially validator consensus key rotation, so validators are free to rotate their consensus key. The other part is the operator key. So you're able to, the operator key is more like the account key. And so you're able to um, rotate that. Some interesting findings, Atish um, who's working on the SDK found a huge performance uh, increase for the infamous uh, validator delegations query. And so he's been implementing that and we've been reviewing it and it should be merged as part of the next release in which you'll, the validator delegation query will be a lot more performant. Circuit breaker is still in review. Oh, I heard someone wrote a message. Yeah, awesome. Atish is posting the uh, PR here. So if you want to give it a read, definitely go take a look. Um, circuit breaker is still in review. And so we're just waiting on a couple more reviews that we'll be able to merge and cut releases. Collections, um, there's a few, we're still migrating some modules. And so there's, um, as we're migrating, we're trying to do it in a way that does not require any uh, large migrations or any migrations at all. So it is a bit slower because we're trying to make sure that everything is state compatible. So there's no downtime when chains are upgrading if they are using collections for the core modules. Maybe C++ plus plus touched on it, auto CLI and Hubble. So we've been, um, Giancarlo has been leading this effort. He's uh, completed phase one, um, about to complete phase two. And then the other phases are also, um, phase 2.5 will begin and phase three is also uh, already started in the Steinwood handler um, scope because we need the Steinwood handlers in order to have full transaction support. Integration testing framework. So as part of Q1, uh, Julian Lakita did a bunch of research on, uh, on our testing, uh, design and kind of talking to some users on how we want to write integration tests. And so they came up and canonicalized it in some documentation and are beginning to rewrite our, um, our integration tests to follow this framework of how to write integration tests for SDK modules and what is the goal of the testing. Um, some more separating SDK modules into standalone Go modules, the epic around storage. So storage is an interesting thing here. We want to basically separate state storage and state commitment. Um, this There was already some work uh, last year on this, and we're going to continue some of that work and also change some of it in order to take advantage of some other benefits. As the V1 implementation of store V2, let's say, the commitment store being used will be IVL. But in Q2, we also, as part of some research we want to do, we will be diving into some commitment structure research. So we've been talking with the team over at Osmosis and Dave um, about basically um, different tree structures, different uh, accumulators that could be used as an alternative to a tree and how that would work with um, the current modules. The thing now uh, that we've identified is basically IVC may need to stay on IVL 
um, but there is a world where the rest of your state machine can use something else. Um, the, the thing that I'm most interested in and uh, that really did as well is KG, KCG commitments to be used as a commitment structure for everything but IBC for existing chains. Um, are there any questions on any of the items here? Awesome. Um, for invariant checking, I missed this one. Um, invariant checking, we want to create a more uh, simpler way to run invariant checking. Right now, the crisis module is like the only way to run invariant checking, and there are issues with the with the current design, and so we want to make it more customizable. But also, um, what does it mean for an invariant to break, and at which at which point, how far of the breaking? Should it, should it be a halt or should it be like a notification to validators to like, that something is going wrong? Right now, even if a benign invariant is broken, um, the chain could potentially halt. Um, those are some of the items. This one could be confusing. This one small uh, announcement that we're gonna do like in Q2 is in the community repo, um, which basically, allows us to have a org level discussion board. So if you've noticed, um, we've, the SDK team has come and we post our, let me see, announcements. We post when we do releases in this, in this section, so releases um, from the SDK, and then you have different sections where you can ask questions, and then this will allow people who may have questions in the future that can use the search in order to find out um, if this question was asked before or if this needs to be asked. So it's in a way like we're trying to, um, this is like an alternative to Stack Overflow for Cosmos. Other teams like the IBC Hub and so on um, may also start using it. Um, I would ask that if anyone has generalized questions about the Cosmos SDK or a question about how something works, that you do come and ask it um, here um, within uh, within the discussion, the org level discussion, so we can allow people to search the answered questions, so maybe that it can help them in the future. That was what the prep for launch is, because we want to make some, we want to do some automation around it, so we can make it as seamless as possible for us, but also for the users. Um, any questions on any of the items? Um, oops, I'm missing when do we think we'll have consensus key rotation? Um, consensus key rotation, the PR is open. Um, there's like one edge case that we're discussing, and after that, um, it should be merged. So there's a potential that it will be in the Eden release, which will be the next release. Awesome. If no one has any more questions, we can also begin, uh, we can see if uh, Devon from Verichain would want to start giving a short presentation around Polaris. Marco, I, I love how you assume it's pronounced Devon. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's like if I say Dev, then I feel like people get confused with Dev. <laughs> with with uh, Osmos is Dev, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, have that, we have that joke internally, actually. It's, it's quite, quite a Is reason. it just Devon? Yeah, yeah, it's just Devon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. My but bad. yeah, no, it's all good then. Not a problem. Um, but uh, but yeah. So let me just make sure my screen is sharing here. I think y'all should be able to see this here. All good. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Um, so yeah, this is actually, so kind of to, to introduce myself, so I'm Dev Bear, CTO at, at BearChain. Um, we actually just announced um, uh, our raise today, so that was super, super exciting. Um, but yeah, so a little bit kind of about Polaris. Um, the idea behind Polaris was we had spent a long time building with Ethermint, um, and basically we had a lot of problems and a lot of things that we thought from an architecture perspective, we could we could improve on. Um, and the idea behind Polaris is effectively it's a completely generic modular way 
to add an EVM to any blockchain. Um, the first of which is a Cosmos SDK blockchain, of course, as being, you know, this is a Cosmos SDK call. Um, and the idea here is that we wanted to replicate Ethereum as closely as possible and use as much of the native features of Geth as possible to ensure compatibility is perfect. Um, so that effectively was the motivation. Um, so a little bit about myself, CTO and co-founder. Um, I was previously a distributed systems engineer at Apple. Um, so I spent almost five years down in the Bay Area, um, most of which was spent at Apple Park, so good times there. Um, and studied software engineering at the University of Waterloo. So I'm Canadian, anyone else who's uh, from Toronto or Waterloo in, in the audience today. Um, so a little bit kind of about our team, a wide variety of, of backgrounds, things from FANG, enterprise sales, even some sovereign wealth funds kind of all over the place. Papa and Smokey, my other two co-founders, um, are both Y Combinator alum and have been a you know, huge part in, in where we are today. Um, so kind of to give a little bit of backstory on BearChain before we dive deep into Polaris, what we're doing is we're effectively replacing kind of the traditional proof of stake, you know, the staking module with what we call proof of liquidity. And the goal for proof of liquidity is kind of three things. The first is to systemically build liquidity as like a core primitive in the chain. So the idea is that instead of just using the staking module and having the network fee token just be the thing that you're staking in order for validator security, what if there was a way to basically incentivize liquidity to be built as this core primitive um, that is securing the network? Like imagine how much more productive some of these other L1s would be if all of the value that's being used in the validator set is also you know, in a liquidity pool, users can use it to transact, et cetera. Um, and a big part of why we set out to build BearChain is you know, through kind of 2021, we were very, very active in the Alt L1 rotation, um, did a lot of trading on Near, mostly EVM chains, Near, AVAX, Phantom, all that stuff. And we saw that there was just a lot of copy pasta forks, and it was just basically a giant casino. And we realized a big part of that was in our belief was that there was no real incentive for innovation or anything because you saw these ecosystems just get pumped by pumped by funds and pumped by basically the idea of liquidity comes, the mining rewards come in, et cetera, and then liquidity dumps and all these projects are left high and dry. Um, so it was kind of a chicken and the egg problem where there's nobody innovatively building on the chain, so there's no reason for these ecosystems to last. And then some people would be like, okay, well, I'm not gonna go you know, spend a bunch of time building a project, I'm not gonna go raise for it, et cetera, if this ecosystem is just going to die. And we see this a lot um, over the past year. We use Boba as an example, right? At their peak, they had 600 something million in liquidity, and now maybe they have 5 million, right? So that was kind of the biggest issue there. The second thing is we wanted to solve stake centralization. Um, we see this especially in Cosmos. I think Kujira were the guys who put it together, that like stake, that stake dashboard. Um, and we saw kind of, yeah, like every Cosmos chain is kind of only as strong as the top five validators. So we wanted to try to solve that as well. And then the third thing is we wanted to try to incentivize protocols to run infrastructure and actually be part of validator set, be part of like that conversation. Because we had seen kind of especially over the past year or so a big disconnect between uh, between like validators and people running validators and people building on the chain. And we wanted a way in order to tie them together. Um, so to kind of explain it high level, basically a user will delegate their BGT, which is one of our tokens to a validator. The validator produces blocks. That validator not only is responsible for producing blocks, but it's also responsible for determining where its block reward goes. Um, so as part of the system, we have a DEX built into the chain, and basically the block reward will get routed as liquidity mining emissions to different pools. Um, and that is incentivizing those users who are the liquidity providers there to go vote back for that validator that's incentivizing the token they want or something. Um, and that creates kind of a symbiotic um, thing between protocols and validators building on the network. Uh, we also have a bribe module as well. So this bribe module will effectively allow um, allow validators to be like, hey, if you delegate your you know your tokens to me, I'll also pay you out in in some sort of arbitrary token. So that creates an interesting ability for protocols who are building on the chain to be like, hey, you know, I want to be able to get emissions for my protocol. What if I could you know have emissions go to people delegating to my validator? Then it ties into the whole thing of block space, and it creates a, an interesting kind of game theory element to the validator set there. Um, kind of then we talk, this is from an old presentation, so there's a few things, but yeah, we talk about kind of why we thought EVM was so strong. And as much as the EVM is old and it's, it's, you know, almost 10 years old at this point, we saw that EVM was where everyone was kind of building. Um, you look at all these, these frameworks that are building, you know, Foundry, Hard Hat, all of the tooling, it really is all EVM based. And we saw that was one of the things when we first got into Cosmos is we felt like that there was a lot of things that just weren't quite there. 
um, in terms of the tooling. Um, but on EVM side, you have all these things. Everyone's building. Everyone's innovating in the space. You look at OP stack. You look at Foundry. You look at all these things. And we felt that we really wanted to find a way to bring EVM to Cosmos in a way that felt more native um, and made it seem like Cosmos and EVM on Cosmos always had this kind of negative connotation to it. And we really wanted to try to like strive um, to push away from that. Um, and this kind of this tooling leads to a huge discrepancy in TVL as well. Um, so this is from this is probably a little outdated now, so from a couple months ago. But the amount of TVL on EVM chains versus the amount of TVL on non-EVM chains is magnitudes larger. Um, and we think developer tooling and just general kind of knowledge base is a large part of doing that. Um, so why Polaris though? The idea behind Polaris is we wanted a way to have app chain frameworks and EVM be able to be more communicative with each other. Um, one of the things, and I, I hate to bash on the Ethermint guys, but one of the things we saw with Ethermint was that there was no real clear separation of where the EVM ended and where the Cosmos began. And it ran into, it, it ended up being a thing where a lot of the design decisions that were made ended up causing a lot of problems with off-chain compatibility. So things like Chainlink, things like Fireblocks, um, things like if you wanted to deploy an OP stack rollup on top of a Cosmos chain that has an EVM. Like things like that were not necessarily as thought out or as planned as, as they maybe should have been. Um, and we saw a lot from our testing is a lot of the people that we were integrating, um, Firebox, for instance, Chainlink, for instance, they couldn't actually get their systems to run properly because of some of the decisions that were made in architecture. Um, and there's this big whole debate between EVM compatibility, EVM equivalence. And we believe that like finding a way for app chain frameworks and, and specifically Cosmos to be able to have an EVM that's running that is as close to Ethereum as possible will ultimately be in the long run a really, really good thing for, for Cosmos in that regard. Um, so to kind of summarize what I said before, the idea is that we have a modular plugin based framework that allows us to basically take any app chain framework and build an EVM on top of it um, by effectively just implementing a bunch of interfaces. So in the case of the case of um, the case of Cosmos, we have our, our XEVM module and our XEVM module is actually very, very small. It has no real business logic in it. It basically is a bunch of CRUD operations that allow us to talk to the framework. Um, so you can think about it as Cosmos is handling all the storage, and then Polaris, the library itself, is handling all the, the semantics around Ethereum and how that works. Um, and a big part of this is that Geth is really nuanced. It's really, really kind of all over the place. It's an old code base. It's been maintained by hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And there's a lot of things that don't necessarily come to you right away, like things about how transaction nonces work and things about order of operations and what constitutes as part of the header and what counts as part of this hash. You know, How does this hash work? How does this cache work? There's a lot of nuance. And one of the things that we think is a big part of why the compatibility on a lot of these like EVM compatible chains is not so great is the nuance of Geth is lost when you try to implement it and integrate it into another framework. Um, so one of the goals with Polaris is that we wanted to try to use as much of the Geth code as possible and maintain that nuance and then make sure that we're just using exactly what Geth is doing um, in order to maintain things like wallet compatibility, off-chain keepers, that type of stuff. Um, and kind of the goal is you have, in, in, the, in the spirit of Cosmos, you have this concept of a pluggable consensus engine like Comet with a pluggable EVM framework. And then that makes everything just kind of, kind of work, where the consensus engine knows nothing about the EVM, the EVM knows nothing about the consensus engine, and you effectively have an adapter or a middleware or however you want to describe it in between that is facilitating the two being able to communicate in a, in a way that they know how. So yeah, so to kind of... Further, further, what I was saying before, we extend the idea of Cosmos behind separating network consensus in the application layer, and we take it a step further in this implementation. Um, so we have our, our standard kind of triple stack that everyone here knows and loves. And then we go a step further and add a fourth building block on top, which is the EVM. And the idea is that we want the EVM to be as decoupled as possible from Cosmos in a way that allows all the compatibility to be perfect because you know, the EVM execution environment doesn't even know it's running on a Cosmos chain. All it knows is, hey, I'm getting, you know, Ethereum headers, I know how to handle those. I'm getting Ethereum transactions, I know how to handle those. And the middleware between the SDK and the EVM is abstracting all of that complexity away. Um, so if we compare them to some of the existing alternatives that we wanted to, you know, go up against when we first started building Barachain, funny enough, it originally actually started as an optimism fork. Um, at the time, we thought, hey, you know, what is the easiest way to do this? You know, what gives us the most flexibility? You know, at the time, this was before the OP stack even existed. 
and there were a lot of interesting things going on there. But we saw with all these other solutions was that there was always trade-offs that we had to make. Um, you know, once you go optimism, right, you're not you're no longer agnostic to a platform, right? You're stuck into that ecosystem. You're now married to being a roll-up. All these different things, right? Stateful precompiles was a big thing for a lot of our core logic. Um, being able to have all of this complicated validator logic tie in to the EVM so that users can users and protocols are able to build dApps and DeFi projects around these kind of base layer primitives was something that was really important to us. Um, so we wanted to make sure support was there as well. Um, additionally, we wanted to make sure that we had access to like having things like interchain accounts and IBC queries and things like that, and not necessarily be reliant on a centralized provider um, like Layer Zero or Synapse or some of the people we're ironically working with. But um, at the time when we first set up at it, we wanted to be you know, everything as permissionless as possible. And being able to do that was, was a big value add to us. Um, and the last thing is we wanted to have that native RPC compatibility. Um, all the external partners we've been working with, that's the number one thing that they ask is, are you guys compatible? Will we run into issues, et cetera? Um, and that was with some of, again, with some other some other implementations, it was if you're going to you know, take a Filecoin RPC or you're going to take a Tendermint RPC and try to make it appear as if it is a Geth RPC, um, you can run into some problems. And it's you know why, why reinvent the real in that regard? Um, so kind of moving on, um, the way that we the way that we view Polaris when we're integrating into Cosmos is we almost view it as two separate chains. Um, and the idea behind this is that we want to be able to have the Ethereum land not have to know anything about how Cosmos works. It doesn't care what a Tendermint block is. It doesn't care what a KV store is. It doesn't care what an IVL tree is. All it cares is that it has a way to write, read and write from a database. It has a way to accept transactions, which are Ethereum transactions, not even Cosmos transactions. And it has a way to get information about a block. Um, so what we do is we, we, we semantically think about this or conceptualize this as a host chain, in which case is Cosmos. And then we have the Polaris chain, which lives kind of inside to the host chain. Um, so you can think of the Polaris chain as a subset of, of the Cosmos block. Um, and we kind of borrowed the terminology from rollups where you think about like, okay, like if I'm running a rollup that's settling on Ethereum, it's almost like a blockchain within a blockchain. And we kind of accept that same idea. Um, but because of the fact that we are accepting and including all of these Ethereum transactions as part of the host block as well, we basically get that whole proof. We don't need fraud proofs. We don't need any of these things because of the fact that the consensus of this Polaris chain is tied into the host chain. And we're able to both record all of the transaction call data on the host chain, as well as effectively the state root of the EVM um, in the host chain, which is you know, semantically not much different than how you know, Optimism works or, or Arbitrum or any of these things. Um, from an architecture perspective, it looks a lot like this. So the host chain, Cosmos, is responsible for P2P. It's responsible for consensus. It's responsible for all of these things. Um, but it needs to allow some sort of interface to pass things to and from the EVM. Um, so we kind of define a series of plugins that allow basically for things like forwarding transactions, like telling the EVM when it needs to produce a block, um, providing a way for these like stateful precompile contracts that allow for you know the EVM to talk to Cosmos and vice versa, and we summarize this into effectively a communication layer or a message channel or however you want to think about it. And then on the flip side, right when you look at the player side of things, it looks very much so like Geth. Um, if you open up our repo and kind of scroll through the core chain side of things, is it it very much so looks like Geth. Um, but we've done a lot of things to abstract away and make it so it's a generic interface that can accept anything. Um, so much like Geth, we have a blockchain object that's responsible for maintaining kind of the life cycle of a blockchain. We have a state processor that's responsible for tracking state transitions. Um, and then what, what we're really excited about is we actually are able to fully just implement Geth's RPC backend. Um, and what the RPC backend allows us to do is it allows us to basically spin up a full gata, native Geth JSON RPC server that's using all of their handler logic. Um, so we were able to implement the full JSON RPC specification in, in I believe it's like 20 lines of code or something like that, um, which is super awesome from a compatibility perspective because of the fact that MetaMask just works. You know, Ledger just works, Wallet Connect works, Gnosis works um, because it's reusing all the code that is running on mainnet. Um, which is which is super exciting and was a big um, one of the biggest things we were excited about this was not having to worry about all these compatibility issues. Um, the second thing that was really important to us was how do we define a way for 
precompiles to be written in a way that's not clunky and, and actually has developer tooling and, and, and things around it. Um, you know, one of the reasons why, kind of going back to what we talked about before, that EVM, we believe that EVM took off, was the tooling was there. Um, and precompiles are something that we think is really, really powerful, especially in the context of merging an EVM with an application, like an app chain, is that it allows us to have and do really, really complicated things in the app chain side that wouldn't necessarily be possible if we just went and forked a guess. Um, like being able to leverage ABCI in order to do things like liquidations on a smart contract or being able to leverage ABCI to, um, you know, do some interesting things with how, uh, you know, how gas prices are calculated. And there's there's tons of opportunities to do super cool things. Um, but sometimes you need a, you know, you need to write relatively complex logic that is not in a Solidity smart contract. Um, and having a strong way to do that kind of relies on, on having a pre-compile system um, but we wanted to make sure that you know users and people who are developing aren't necessarily just worried about getting the precompiles to work, um, but can really just write precompiles like you would a smart contract. That's kind of the idea. So effectively, how it works on on Polaris is the user has to do exactly what you would do when you write a contract. Uh, you define your interface, um, and then you define a series of functions that implement that interface. Um, so, for instance, here, this is an example of our precompiled contract that talks to the staking module, right? The Solidity interface looks very, very familiar um, to, to EVM users, right? You have, you know, delegate, you have an amount, you have an address. Um, in the case of kind of those two at the top, we have one is the, is the uh, EIP55 hex encoded address, and then the bottom one, the string call data, would be the BEC32, so we have some flexibility there. Um, but if you look on the right, implementing our precompiled functions looks very much so just like writing a bunch of functions. And that was the end goal, is we didn't want users to have to worry about you know, parsing all these bytes and doing all these weird things and hooking things up and registering and, and doing all of these things that are very nuanced, to go back to so what we were saying before about Geth. We wanted users to be able to be like, hey, you know, I want to write a precompile. All I have to do is you know, define this little go struct, write a bunch of functions. I don't have to worry about revert logic. I don't have to worry about anything. It just, it just kind of works, which is super cool. Um, so what we call this is we call this our precompiled development kit. Um, so the developer is responsible for writing a Solidity interface. It's responsible for writing a Go module or a Go package, basically. And then we actually have sort of like a compilation system that compiles the Solidity down into the ABI, uses a bunch of like Go's ABI gen feature or Geth's ABI gen features, and actually produces what we call a container, kind of stealing it from Docker. Um, then given this container, you basically just plug this container into the host chain, and then now you have a precompile that is executing whatever you would like defined by the behavior of your container. So in the case of the staking module, we have our interface, and then our Go struct effectively just calls the message server of the staking module. Um, so it's really kind of simple in, in that regard. So what's really cool about this, though, is it allows us to like define a really cool kind of DeFi logic um, and create some cool, some cool primitives in Cosmos because we have access to it. Um, so kind of I know Zucky has the liquid staking module that he's been he's been pushing recently. But here's an example of like if we, you know, in a world in which we didn't have that, we can basically define a uh, a smart contract that does the same thing um, in much simpler. So here's kind of a demo of, of this working here. So we have a little kind of liquid staking contract that is effectively just, you know, minting you an ERC20 for calling the precompile. Right, so this is this demo is a little bit long, but for instance, here you can see you know delegator shares are or some big round number, right? And then we're going to go and we're going to deploy a uh, a smart contract here that ERC twenty. Then from here we see the you know contracts deployed, and then if we go and actually call delegate on this ER, on this ERC twenty contract, you know we're going to send it some amount of of the native token in this example. And then what this will do is this will go and mint the actual, um, or this will actually go and delegate exactly. Um, now, the other thing that's really cool is what we've done is you can see that there's a bunch of logs in this transaction. Um, and what's interesting about these is you'll see kind of where under the cursor is now, that address there is actually the address of the staking precompile. 
Um, so what we were able to do is we were able to write effectively a translation layer that converts Cosmos SDK events into Ethereum logs so that users who are, are using precompiles and data science tools and, and people who are writing dApps actually have insights into what's going on inside the Cosmos SDK module when they're executing it, which is super cool. Um, and we basically use a bunch of regex and reflect in order to, to translate those events. So, and you can see the delegation, the delegation is there. Um, so yeah. Um, we're also working with a few a few teams who are building in Cosmos right now. Um, super close with the Skip guys, um, and we're doing some really cool um, kind of flashbots type things that's going to tie directly into Polaris, so that users who are like doing things in the EVM and people who are traditionally able to run like MevBots on Ethereum chains will be able to get a really similar experience um, on Polaris and, and reuse a lot of the tooling that they have. Um, one of the big things is that the the MEV community on the EVM side is really really large. Um, so by having a, a EVM friendly interface for them to to write their their code through, you don't necessarily have to onboard them into Cosmos, and you really reduce the friction from them deploying their code. Um, Scott and the guys over at Argus are using basically uh, the PDK for some of their cross VM stuff. Um, so they're kind of working on some, some interesting things there. And then we're also working with the Catalyst guys around um, some IBC, ICA, and uh, ICS type precompiles um, to really go through and finish out um, having that native built into the chain, ready to go, permissionless, kind of cross chain, cross chain system. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much pretty much the rundown. We're also kind of working on a on a few things um, on the on the role kit side as well. I've been working with Diego over at Celestia. He has a basic implementation um, of players working on role kit, which is super awesome. And then we've also been kind of exploring some ideas around some non Cosmos things as well, i.e., you know, an AVEX subnet host chain or or things like that. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's pretty much Polaris. Um, I'd love to kind of if anyone has any questions or anything, um, love to love to to answer answer anything because I know that was uh, a bit high level of a presentation, but uh, but yeah. Are you guys looking into like future fraud provability uh, of of the EVM implementation? I know that um, uh, Optimism has Canon and they run a stripped down version of Geth, Mini Geth, um, and, and they compile to MIPS. Have you guys like? looked into this or are you guys considering this for the future? Yeah, it's something that like I think is super, super important because we want to be able to like at the this is the thing that I've always kind of of said and I've said this to Marco probably a dozen times is that as much as I kind of love Cosmos, it's sometimes difficult to recommend people build in Cosmos because you know there isn't an EVM that's really, really strong. Um, so one of the things that I want to take Polaris to is like how can we make Polaris and Cosmos really like an OP stack rival? Um, in the sense that you know, you look at a at a real comparison, not kind of a, a fluffy one I did on a slide deck, um, and see like, okay, like this is a real, real alternative. And I think going down that kind of fraud provability route is something that is a big, big part of this. Um, so I think like like Canon and Minigeth and those type of things are super, super cool. It's not something we've spent a ton of time on yet, um, just because we're still um, still kind of working out the bugs with Polaris, getting our main kind of core business logic on the bear chain side um, done as well. Um, but it's something that uh, that I do want to go down at some point. Um, if you know anyone that would be interested in working on that boat, definitely, definitely hit me up. Like, are you kind of like talking about like the? Do you have like a preferred approach? I know like Arbitrum's um, doing something with like their Wasm implementation. Canon's doing um, uh, sorry, Optimism's doing Canon with MIPS. Um, is there like do you prefer one over the other or? I think it's. I think the thing that's difficult is that you're in a world in which every chain might have very, very custom logic. Um, so in the case of like Optimism, for instance, you're basically just running the same identical virtual machine that's running on mainnet. So that makes things a lot easier in that regard. Um, I think the MIPS approach is interesting because it can run like the way that that Optimism's done it is they're running it kind of on the EVM itself, which I think is really interesting. Um, I, I'm not too knowledgeable on the Arbitrum approach to be to be totally honest. Um, it's, it's something I just have to kind of dive in and, and look into. Um, my bias leads more towards the MIPS approach, but um, it's the one I'm way more familiar with. So kind of a little bias there. Makes sense, makes sense. Awesome. Anyone else have any questions for Devin?
Awesome. Then that is all for today's working uh, today's community call. Um, uh, last call for questions. Otherwise, we can end 10, 15 minutes early. The other thing, Marco, is that we want to, if, if anyone's interested, talk about the transaction pool not stuff, if anyone has any thoughts on that. I know we haven't really yeah, discussed anything, but. So, so I guess for, uh, for context for everyone, um, how transactions are handled in depth is a lot different than how transactions are handled on submission in Cosmos. In Cosmos, we have this like anti-handler that basically checks the nonce to be higher um, than the current one, but it, it can't be too much higher so, because it's more technically increasing. And so if there's a secret mismatch, you, you get a lot of these errors. A lot of these errors are kind of like really prevalent with relayers. And so um, one thing that I've been talking with the Veritrain folks uh, is like there is a possibility of like getting rid of that anti-handler check and that chains could do it. The only thing is like the mempool implementation um, which the defaults in the SDK, the, the ones provided, the default is a no op, but the ones provided do handle nonce checking. So it's like if there's two nonces, uh, two of the same nonces in existence, then um, the one with the higher gas will override the old one. Um, that's kind of similar to how things are done in Ethereum. And then you'd be able to kind of get rid of this anti handler check because anti handler check is kind of causing issues. Um, there's like some edge cases around that. Um, anything else you want to add, Dev? Yeah, the, so basically the issue is that um, to give a case study of what happens is let's say I submit a bunch of transactions to an RPC, let's say I submit 10 transactions to an RPC um, in really, really quick succession. Um, and basically due to like, let's say you're running it through a load balancer or something, those transactions might not necessarily show up to the, to the node in the order that you sent them. And you know, let's say you sent them an increasing nonce. What can happen is that all of the transactions except for one end up bouncing because, like, let's say transaction with nod six comes before transaction with nods five. Um, transaction with nod six will just get bounced off the anti handler during check TX, and then transaction nods five will get included, like inserted into the mempool. Um, but with a priority nonce mempool, you could have just inserted both, and then the nonce mempool would have just figured it out. Um, so what the compatibility issue happens is a lot of EVM uh, EVM protocols that are deploying contracts typically use things like hard hat scripts and forward scripts, which often can submit you know 10, 15, 20 transactions in really rapid succession. Um, and these forward scripts will actually just bounce off and fail um, because like they're basically submitting them so fast um, and they're properly nonced, so they should all just work in order. Um, but it'll make it so that from a from a developer experience perspective, um, EVM developers can't use these really, really common tools, um, which is a huge UX problem um, and something that uh, is a thing is an issue with Ethermint and was a big part of why we stepped away from it. So the the solution basically would be to, um, as Marco said, you would skip the transaction increment or the nonce increment in the anti handler and then define some sort of uh, some sort of standard standard kind of nonce increment logic in the in the mempool. The other thing you could do as well is you could run uh, you could in the in the case of how it's set up now is you could just move the anti handler to after the upside mempool. So you could have it so you're inserting transactions that don't necessarily pass check TX into the upside mempool. Very similarly to how like you can insert a transaction into the comment mempool that will then get bounced if it fails check TX. Um, so right now the order is kind of you have the comment mempool, then you have check TX, or sorry, then you have the anti handler, and then you have the app side mempool. So you have like this weird sandwich issue. If you moved it so it was like comment, then app side, then check TX, then that would solve the issue as well. Um, and then you wouldn't have to modify the anti handler logic. It would just be you'd have to then figure out some sort of like denial of service protection for the app side mempool. That would be the only the only downside. Um, but that could be implemented yeah. as one of the base examples. Um, yeah, that's it simpl yeah, I think it also simplifies a lot of like this like check state um, resetting and setting that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as we just check that the um, that the nonce is higher than the one written to state, then I think everything else should be handled like elsewhere. 
Yeah, I think it's more so like the idea around like that whole, and Mark, I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago, like that whole run TX function is just a spaghetti mess. I think like coming up with clear definitions for which code paths are, <laughs> Matt's like clapping, <laughs> which, which code paths are being executed when and having really clear, well-documented, this runs here, that runs there, this runs during check TX, this runs during deliver TX, et cetera, et cetera, um, would really go a long way towards like, being making it easier to avoid these issues in the first place, but also make sure that if we're moving anti-handler code around, we know exactly when things are being executed. Um, like the whole thing where like anti-handlers will be like if check TX, if recheck TX, like it's just a really bad yeah. developer experience. Um, it should almost Definitely. be like a, some sort of some sort of framework that can allow you to be like, I want to run this on this, this on that, and this on this type thing. We, funny enough, we were just talking about like base app and like all the different states on our team call right before this. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> because we, we, we were also like, um, there's like some confusion on why some things were sent um, in places when it may have not been needed. And so one of the actionables was just to identify um, at which point we're writing to states um, that are could be used because these states that are being written with prepare and process proposal could be non-deterministic, meaning some of the states within a context could be H minus two, so height minus two instead of height minus one. And if the user doesn't expect that, then it could cause them issues. Um, so stuff like that, like kind of like gotchas that we want to identify yeah. not only for users, but also for ourselves. Um, yeah, I think so that would, I know this is also would be a big change as well, but if we're going to like go down that rabbit hole, maybe addressing like the delayed execution thing could be something as well. I don't know if that's still well, the, the delayed execution thing. Uh, so it's like there's optimistic, there's delayed, optimistic, and immediate. And like yeah. to get to immediate, I think we need some changes in comment. Um, ah, okay. Like we need to we need to be able to like return the app hash in like prepare a proposal because you need to start executing it then. Um, and so sense. like. So, and there's like some gotchas around that that like change the comment implementation. Um, and so I think they they have that in mind when, when they're doing a lot of this work. And I think they want to allow it. it it's specified that they want to allow it. Optimistic execution is already something that we can do, but the execution environments that I think differ the most um, for like EVM and stuff is this delayed um, work. Yeah, makes uh, yeah that that's definitely one of the biggest things with EVM is like we we have to do some weird weirdness to make it work um, yeah. because of how you know geth is effectively immediate execution so it's you have to kind of mess with things a little bit it works out but it can cause some kind of weird semantic issues yeah exactly exactly um, awesome sweet so yeah if anyone has any yeah Matt, go. yeah I. I um, just checking it about the knots priority knots mempool. I I implemented it, and I was also surprised to kind of figure out that it wouldn't work with the current way that we're handling knots is with the anti handler. So just just saying, I hear your request, and uh, it's something I'm going to be thinking about how to maybe move that around and keep supporting our current use case, but also maybe make it possible to to not have that um, knots stuff in check TX. And the anti yeah, yeah, what what we did for temporarily is we basically just like have this like d this like uh, how do I even describe it? Um, it's basically we like skip some of the nonces or some of the checks. So we have like this like wrapper that basically will just skip it for our. Um, I just sent a link here that will basically just skip certain um, anti handler declarations if it detects it's like an ETH transaction, um, and that's effectively how we get around it today. And then we check our. Uh, we check our Ethereum signatures as part of our like custom app side mempool. Um, that's how we just get around it. So um, just to be able to like not run into those issues, um, it's a little hacky, but it does um, it does work um, because we like do all our gas consumption and signature verification and and uh, like non increment and stuff as part of our state machine transition. So we actually do it like after the transaction is included in the block. Um, and then it's the responsibility of our mempool to basically track like what's the like pending nonce versus like the one on disk. Okay, this makes sense. Yeah, thanks for the link. I'll have a look. No problem. Because yeah, one of the things we wanted to do was like not have to, not have to have like two sets of anti handlers. 
Um, like in Ethermint, there's the whole like, if it's an Ethereum handler, do all this like weird anti-handler logic that's very Ethereum specific. And then if it's a regular Cosmos transaction, then just like not do all that stuff and use a different set. So we really wanted to make sure that we didn't have that like duplication of 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 code, and that's why we just like went this route. Um, was like use the geth native validation stuff, and then just if geth already handles it, then just skip it in the Cosmos side. I mean, that's where that eth skip decorator thing comes from. Awesome, awesome, sweet. That brought us to the top of the hour. Thanks, thanks for coming on, Dev, on such short notice. No uh, problem. Thank I you. Wish everyone have a good weekend. Hopefully it's sunnier than and better weather than it is in Berlin. Um, and enjoy the weekend. Ciao, ciao. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.